Hello and welcome. I am Dogbert and welcome back to Dogbert's Sports Card School. Today I will be talking about starting out buying and selling, what you need to know to start, and this whole topic is huge. Obviously this is the main part of your business if you're trying to get into sports cards and do this type of stuff like I'm doing right now. So because this is such a huge topic, I had to figure out how to break it all up. And I thought this would be a good first intro, good information for it. And because the information is so important, I'm going to leave the screen. You're just going to hear my voice. No more dog avatar. So that we don't block any of the information that you might need. Uh, it is definitely important information in this video. So let's get started. So the first thing you need to answer is what is your goal? That is going to be our first topic. We're also going to go over what are you going to buy and sell, obviously. How much capital you need to start, how much money you need to start. We'll go over that. Where to get cards. This is this going to be a real brief, basic overview. This can actually get a lot more in-depth, of course, with buying and selling. That's going to get more in-depth as well. And equipment and supplies you're going to need to get started. So... We have to first answer the question of what our goal is with this business, what you're trying to do with this, like me. And we'll go over my goal, too, again, if you didn't see my intros. So the first person I could think of is somebody who wants to collect. He wants to sell some on the side or a little to fund his collecting. This is more of a collector. I think this is where a lot of people fall into when they first get into this, they want to collect the cards. You know, you're going to get cards you don't necessarily collect or want. You might get tired of whatever. So you're going to sell them off so you can get the cards you do want. So you have money to buy there. You know, and then there's the next people. You know, they just want a little side hustle, bring in a little bit of extra cash. This is something you can definitely do part time on the side, depending on how serious you really want to get into it. How You know, the more time you put in. Uh, you know, the more you're going to grow, the more you're going to make. You just want something on the side to bring a few extra bucks in. This goes back to, again, like collecting and uh, selling. Again, this is getting a little bit more serious. Uh, this is where I'm at. This is my goal. A side hustle to augment my full-time job. In other words, I have so much income coming in that it can match, rival my full-time job income so if something happened with my full-time job i at least have still have some income wouldn't have benefits or anything like that like health insurance that i need but at least i would have some cash uh constantly coming in where, it, where i need to find another job maybe i could take a little bit less money uh to get that as long as i can keep doing this on the side and then probably the hardest thing to do is just doing sports cards full-time period end of story this is all you do this is your living this is your life uh very difficult to do uh, a lot of people did try this back with the boom uh which was like 2018 is when it really started and it kind of fizzled out around 2022 2021 around that area that's when the bubble burst and these people a lot of people had to go back to their regular jobs or get regular jobs again um like i said it's very difficult to do as we'll get into in future videos why it's so difficult. So, first thing you need to, once you have your goal set, you know what you do? You need to figure out what the hell are you buying and selling in the first place. And my thing, my advice I would always give anybody is go with the sports or sports you are most familiar with. This could also mean if you're most familiar with Pokemon, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, Magic the Gathering. Uh, if those are the things you're most familiar with, uh, go with those. If, I don't know the TCG area, uh, so I don't really speak about it because of that. Uh, a little bit different markets there, but I know like Pokemon's definitely like number one that I know. And if you know that, if you know those markets and you know those really well, you're passionate about them, absolutely positively go with them. Uh, a lot of this information in, this, in the buying and selling will apply to that as well. You just have to adjust it to what you know works inside those areas, though. So where the money is currently, as far as sports cards, though, is football is absolutely number one uh, right now with the money. Uh, basketball used to be number one. They've dropped down to number two. The interest in basketball has gone down a little bit, and I think it's still going down. 
uh, overall, but uh, it's still up there. Number three is baseball. It kind of just remains steady, maybe a little drop, maybe a little increase, not much. Hockey has been a solid number four for a long, many, 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 many years. It's always been number four. Uh, number five right now is soccer. We did see a resurgence. Everybody thinks it's going to have another resurgence when the World Cup comes back to the USA. It, it never really bloomed into where it could compete with hockey even. Uh, it just hasn't happened. I don't know if it ever happened. Because so much of the sports card market is controlled by the United States. Yes, there is an international market. But there's nowhere near the amount of collectors and buyers and sellers as there is in the United States. And number six would be just everything else, whether that be WWE, NASCAR, golf, MMA, uh, pickleball now, bowling, believe it or not, has sports cards. There's just a whole lot of everything else in it, I, I threw into this pot. And to be quite honest, it's wrestling WWE, which is probably going to be the one that emerges out of the, that pot from what I'm seeing. Um, it's getting close to taking over soccer. Uh, it's not quite there yet, though. So when we're also talking about buying, selling, what about the different markets? Well, I, like I said, football is number one, but something you got to be <laughs> got to take into account is there's lots of competition because of that, and there's going to be high wax prices. Uh, wax prices are sealed product or boxes, things you buy in the store or buy online, whatever. So that you have to keep that in mind. Like I said, basketball is number two. It used to be number one. Same problems here are going to uh, com uh, come into play. Lots of competition, high wax prices. Baseball's an oddity one. The wax prices are a little bit higher. It's an odd market. The timing you have to buy and sell is a little weird. Uh, when we get into football and basketball and other sports, uh, baseball is a little bit different how things are, get driven in prices and that is 100% is stats driven. In other words, you could never watch a baseball game in your life and just look at the stats and know who is going to be good to buy and sell. Yeah, and it's that simple. Whereas like with football, basketball, and the other sports, those big sports like that, you really need to watch the games or watch, watch the players. And that's why I say keep with the sports you know. Hockey, again, this is more like basketball and football. You need to watch the games, but it also has an international customer base, meaning if you're going to deal in hockey cards, 100% expect to have to ship to other countries, mostly Canada, obviously. Uh, that's just where the, the customer base is. It's bigger up there, not as big down here in the United States, and that does hurt it. But there is still quite a fan base for hockey, and I love hockey personally. Uh, it's just a matter of where it being realistic of where it is as far as sports court goes. Five soccer again, another international customer base. It has grown, but it has shrunk again uh, within the United States. Whether or not it will ever actually catch on, uh, yes, there's an international market for this where it can get pretty big, but overall, the money is still here in the United States that mostly buys this. but Again, if you're dealing in soccer, again, expect to be shipping overseas. And then you have everything else. Uh, when it comes to everything else, you have uh, very little competition, but you also have a smaller pool of buyers as well to drive those prices. Things could sit around a little bit longer, whereas uh, the bigger sports, you could sell the stuff a lot quicker for profits. Uh, like I said, though, like I see WWE coming up uh in the future, which we'll all get into in their whole WWE video about buying and selling those cards. So on the other, on the topic of what do you want to buy and sell, you also have to figure out what kind of cards you want to sell. This I divided into four categories. Now my definitions with these prices could be different from your definitions, what you consider depending on uh, what you're comfortable with paying for things and what you would want to consider them. I consider low end cards less than $20. Uh, this will come down to when we're, uh, actually looking into where to buy and sell, uh, the standards of, uh, eBay standard envelope, pretty much. I'm going about those standards and they pretty much consider low end cards to be less than $20 a piece. Mid end cars I consider to be $20. More than $20, but less than $250. Again, we'll get into that more why I consider that. Uh, more or less at $250, though, with eBay, that's when you get into auth authenticity guarantee. That's why I kind of put mid-end here. 
And high-end cards I consider to be over $250, but less than 1000 Because I think once you start paying $1,000 for just one card, you get into the who the fuck pays this much category, which is more than $1,000 for a single card. There are cards, literally brand new cards, that will cost you thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. And even in the case of like the Victor Wembeana, one of one, they expect that to be you know, one, two, possibly even three million. I don't think it's going to hit three. It'll probably be between one and two million dollars for a brand new card, believe it or not. That is how ridiculous how much money has gotten really put into this stuff. And I could go on and on about this stuff, uh, <laughs> about how this all works. But the video will get too long and we have to move on. So how much capital do you need to start? Well, technically, you could start it with as little as $100. Uh, there's a YouTube series being done by a guy who is like a breaker. Uh, it's not the greatest YouTube series, but it's an interesting YouTube series he's doing. His goal is to, st he started out with $100 cash and he wants to get to $100,000 within one year using that $100 to start. Obviously, this is somebody who is uh, into the industry, been into the industry, has the knowledge. And I think he's into a He's up there, I think around to ten thousand dollars already. Uh, I think it's like eight or nine weeks in. I'm not actually sure. If I, uh, I'll probably link it down in the description to his YouTube channel, and you can see him. I mean, uh, what he's doing, how he's buying. It's interesting to see what he's buying and selling. Uh, how he started out with a hundred dollars, and how he's trying to get to a hundred thousand dollars within one year with just a hundred dollars start, which is uh, very difficult, obviously. Realistically, though, if you came and asked me, just a general all-around number to start with would be $2,000. Of course, the more money you put in, the quicker you will grow. Or, you know, you make off of your money. But there's also the other thing is, do you expect to have some things go south? Things happen. Players become injured. Uh, players do things off the field. You know, you could have a Wander Franco situation. If you're not familiar with Wander Franco in baseball... He was a shortstop for the Tampa Bay Rays. He looked to be the guy. He's going to be a franchise guy, generational talent, whatever you want to call him. So they gave him a big 10-year, $200 million guaranteed thing. He's going to the All-Star game. Then all of a sudden, last season, 2023, he's just gone from the team. Uh, because it turned out he it was messing with a 14-year-old in his home country and there's a whole big thing about that this is of course an extreme but people literally had thousands of dollars into his cards speculating on him to be the next great big uh great, next greatest thing and overnight they lost thousands of dollars because of that you had Rashe rice in baseball he got into that big car accident racing cars uh, thankfully, nobody was killed that in football, I mean. Uh, so that will probably just get blown under the table. He might get suspended for a couple games. It might hurt him a little bit in the beginning of the season. But overall, it won't affect him long term unless he does something stupid like that again. And those are the things that can happen, uh, you know, during the course of a season. Of course, then injuries happen. I mean, I don't know how many quarterbacks we had get injured last year. Um, a lot of the big name starters, of course, they just had bad seasons or they got injured. You know, that thing can, that can always happen. And if you have cards out for grading or you just happen to get the inventory, all of a sudden that $100 card might be a $10 card or a $1,000 card became a $10 card. God forbid, <clears throat> you know, things are just going to go up and down of markets. I call, I would call sports card. It's kind of like you're buying stock, sports betting, all in one, pretty much. So the next thing is, of course, once you decide how much you got, you need to buy some cards, obviously. So what are you going to be doing? Are you going to buy single cards, whether this be raw or, raw or slabbed? This is just a basic, I want to buy them and flip them. This usually requires you holding on to them for a period of time and praying to God the player does well, the team he does well, so that his prices go up and not down. So that's the obvious risks there. Uh, this is, of course, probably best for collectors as well, just to do that if they're uh, trying to just collect. That's what they'll generally do. 
Then you have the buying single cards to grade. This is also known as the raw to grade flip. This is where I make most of my money. Uh, to be honest with you, there's great uh, amount of profits to be made here, but also a great amount of risk. You buy single cards that are not graded, and you're looking to get buy them at cheaper prices, get them graded, get a PSA 10, hopefully. That is your ultimate goal. And then you quickly turn around and resell it, getting the PSA 10 prices, which are considerably higher than the raw prices. Of course, then you also have that you have to know exactly what you're buying. You have to know that this player is going to be hot because it could take two or three months to get these cars back from grading. And like I said, that's what happened with the Wander Franco situation where people lost thousands of dollars overnight because they had cards out for grading. They're stuck. They already pay, they're paying for the grading no matter what at this point. And they're going to lose their grading fees. They're going to lose their shirts on what they pay, put into the card. Things like that can happen. So it has to be somebody you, you need to buy and have uh, stay consistent. Either go up or stay consistent where you think it's going to, you're going to be buying at. It's still going to be where you're going to be able to sell at within a month or two or even three. You could be doing this also. You can be taking a bit more of a risk. And trying to do this and think the player is going to be doing good. And then you have it ready for the minute he does good so you can hit the market immediately. There's different ways of doing it. Uh, we'll get into that more in another video. <laughs> Buying lots or collection. These are lots of cards. So somebody puts up a box filled with 3,000 cards. You buy that whole box. You might be only paying like a nickel per card or less or 10 cents a card or whatever. Or they're just trying to get out of the hobby altogether or somebody passed away uh so you buy the entire collection of cards and you're going to be buying this roughly you know 30 percent maybe at most maybe 40 percent if it's a really good collection you're buying a large amount of bulk and then you're going to piece them out one by one which is a lot of work obviously a lot of selling to do but it is a way to get cards and there's also buying and opening wax i do this as well uh, there's a lot of people who tell you never to do this. You will lose money. I will make a whole video of buying an opening wax because if you do it wrong, you are guaranteed to lose money. Almost guaranteed, almost hundred percent guaranteed to lose money. If you do it right, you have a good chance of making money, but you can still lose money as well. It is risky to do it. So that's why it's going to take a whole video on just that. And then the last thing, which you should absolutely positively never do is buy into breaks. But this is this is gambling upon gambling, in my opinion. <laughs> You're buying into a break where you only get a certain team or a certain player, and then you're hoping to God that whoever's opening that wax, that that player or team comes up. I could get into that more as well. Uh, another video just on that of why it's so bad. So the other thing you got to think about, these are equipment and supplies you will absolutely need. There's also some optional supplies and equipment you'll need, which depending on what you're doing, become necessary equipment you need. So let's just go over the things that everybody's going to need. That's a place to store your inventory. You got to have a place to put this stuff until you get it sold, whether it be a box here, a box there. Keep it in a climate controlled area, though. You don't want to be throwing it. Uh, you don't want it to get wet. You don't want it to get too hot. That could make the cards become brick if they are and stick together, destroying them as well. So you want to keep it somewhat climate controlled. The nice thing about cards is they're fairly small, so you can keep them in a closet somewhere. This will have a little extra space around the house. Or if you're really, really getting into it, you'll actually get into like warehouses and stuff. The other thing is you got to get organized. You got to know where these things are. You got to be able to find the cards, especially if you're selling singles or something. You got to know where exactly to look for it and find that card. You don't want to be spending an hour looking for a single card. You want to get the card, find that card in that inventory, get it out within a couple minutes, if not less. And you're going to need to do know some basic things about accounting, have a way to account for things, keep track of your buying and purchasing just to see if you have a profit or loss. It can get a lot more in-depth, even though I'm not an accountant, but I know some basics. So you're going to need to know some basics. This is running a business. This is why you need to be organized. This is why you have to have accounting. You're going to have to pay your taxes, things like that. You're going to need a printer. Everybody's going to need a printer at some sort, whether it be printing out forms to get cars graded, printing out shipping labels. You're going to have to ship these things to people eventually. 
you know, anything like that, you're going to need some kind of printer at some point. And you're going to need either envelopes or bubble mailers, again, depending on the kind of card you're sending. Envelopes are generally for the lower end stuff. Bubble mailers, once you get into the mid and upper ranges, you're going to need those. You're going to need a camera and or a scanner. A camera on a phone is perfectly fine. They actually do a great job. But you need a way to take uh, or scan the cards in. You need to either take pictures or scan cards in, I should say. Because you need to list these things somewhere. People need to be able to see them somehow, some way, in order to buy them. So other equipment and supplies you need, I would consider optional equipment, depending, again, on what you're going to do. That is a label printer. This becomes an absolute necessary. It is a godsend when you're doing low-end cards because you're doing a lot of volume, so you're going to be printing out and shipping a lot. I know that definitely changed my my whole approach to low-end cards and what a godsend that has been. It's just a thermal label printer. Uh, you don't need this to start. If you just like, I don't know if I want to do this, don't buy one of these yet. But once you're like, yeah, I want to do this, definitely get a label printer uh and depending on what you're doing if you're just buying card slab you don't need as much of this stuff but you do need some of it that is penny sleeves top loaders team bags card savers some cardboard you should never pay for and one touch cases depending again this is going to depend on what exactly you're doing low end you definitely need penny sleevers top loaders team bags maybe even card savers uh, once you get into the mid to high end, you absolutely need the cardboard in addition to those things. And maybe even some one-touch cases. If you're doing slabs, they have uh, graded card sleeves just to give a little extra protection. You definitely need the cardboard again with them and bubble mailers and all that stuff. Just things to protect the cards in general. And the other thing is then you, if you're, especially if you're doing low end, you're going to want to document feed scanners so you can actually take the cards and just scan them very quickly. I have a low end scanner for that and or a flat bed scanner. The reason being we want a flat bed scanner is for thicker cars that you can't put into a document feed scanner. These could be like patch cars. They could be slab cards, whatever. A flat bed will allow you to scan those cars and put those in depending on what you're needing to do. Just some equipment you can think about. And that about wraps it up for today, this video. I mean, this one's already 22 minutes long, and I'm barely scratching the surface of everything that I want to get into when it comes to buying and selling. I definitely talk for hours, and I probably will once we get into the next videos. Until next time, everybody.